Welcome to the WP Tonic This Week in WordPress and SaaS podcast, where Jonathan Denwood interviews the leading experts in WordPress, e-learning, and online marketing to help WordPress professionals launch their own SaaS. Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic This Month in WordPress and SaaS. This is episode 777. Lucky sevens. Lucky for somebody, probably not me. We've got a great panel. They look rested. They re- they've been on their holidays, their journeys. We've got a great guest. We've got Devin Walker from us, um, with us, I should say, um, a great friend of the show from Stella WP. And we've got some fantastic stories. We're going to be talking about WordCamp USA. We're going to be talking about Apple reversing their decisions um, to allow people to repair their computers, so nice of them. Um, we're going to be talking about a great interview with Jamie and Kevin Gurry um, that I thought was really very insightful. We just got a great s- list of stories. Um, I'm going to let the panel quickly introduce themselves. First of all, ladies. So, Heather, would you like your muted though, Heather? Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I am Heather wild Renzi. I am the CTO of The Difference Consulting, and I am a good longtime friend of Jonathan. Oh, thank you. Um, I've let, Let's let Devin introduce himself. So, Devin, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Hey, Devin Walker, um, creator of GiveWP and uh, now GM at Stellar WP uh, in San Diego, California. It's a rough life, isn't it, David? <laughs> well, yeah, we're getting harsher yeah. weather now. So, yeah, a little well, bit. Well, it's like two degrees the normal. <laughs> yeah. um, I've got Kurt. Kurt, do you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely, Jonathan. My name is Kurt Von Annen. I own Manana Nomas. We focus largely on membership and learning sites, and I work with Lifter and Jonathan at WP Tonic. It does. Thank you. I've got Spencer, Spencer, who has to put up with my madness, my craziness. So, Spencer. I took, I took a two-week vacation from that. I feel very rested. It's it's Spence from WVLaunchify.com. Yeah. Uh, um, you look very rested, actually. Uh, um, uh, um, um, got another, got my friend Chris. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Chris from Lifter LMS, Learning Management System for WordPress, and also a podcast for WordPress and course creators called LMS Cast. That's fantastic. And before we go into the main meat and potato of the show, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. Are you looking for ways to make your content more engaging? Sensei LMS by Automatic is the original WordPress solution for creating and selling online courses. Sensei's new interactive blocks can be added to any WordPress page or post. For example, interactive videos let you pause videos and display quizzes, lead generation forms, surveys, and more. For a 20% off discount for the tribe, just use the code WPTONIC, all one word, when checking out and give Sensei a try today. We're coming back, folks. I just want to point out we've got some great special offers from our sponsors, plus the created list of the best WordPress plugins that will allow you to build your clients' projects out as quickly as possible. To get all these goodies, all you have to do is go over to wp-tonic.com slash deals, wp-tonic.com slash deals, and you find all the goodies there. What more could you ask for? A lot more, but you're not going to get it. So just get used to it. So there we go. So um, let's go straight into it. WordCamp US. So Devin, what do you, you know, what was it like? What was the feel? What was your reflections of the event after a few days recovery? Yeah, I thought it was a, a really great WordCamp. The venue was very nice. Um if I had one complaint about the venue, it was just that the sponsors hall was kind of far from the actual uh, session area, but that's kind of nitpicking. Um, I have to admit, I didn't sit in very many talks, but I heard the NASA one was really good. I think we're going to be talking about that as well, uh, based on that Torque article. And then um, lots of conversations about AI, which was uh, really interesting, and we're doing a lot with that. So I had a lot of fun with that. 
Um, but the hallway track was awesome. You know, everybody um, had a great time connecting and networking. And that's always my favorite part uh, of the WordCamp. And I just thought it was awesome. Like we're, you know, back to a high number of attendees after last year in San Diego was really limited in the number of attendees. And so um, I, I really enjoyed that part. I didn't lose my voice also. So it was a great WordCamp in my opinion. Oh, well, that's a bonus, isn't it? There we go. So, Spencer, what did you seem to have a very enjoyable time? So, uh, what was the general buzz that you got from it? I did. I got to add to my list, uh, including Devin, uh, who I got to finally meet in person. San Diego was like a cocktail party. Uh, this one was more like almost a proper event, still very small compared to normal, you know industry events. I think it was what about 2000 people some have I heard Drupal has 4000 on average. But it definitely felt like there was something to do, someone to see, somewhere to go at all times. Uh everybody seemed to congregate before and after all the event stuff in the various locations of this gigantic nice hotel. I stayed down the street and the, the town was really set up for this. You know, it was set up just a bunch of hotels around a kind of cute little fake town that had lots of restaurants so you could come and go you didn't have to be stuck in one spot um, without having a car. So I really enjoyed it. And uh, I did a short version of it. I did from Friday to uh, Sunday. A lot of people were there from Monday. I don't know how they pulled that off, but there was a lot of stuff in DC for people to visit. So maybe that's how. But I, I thought it was a really uh, everything you'd want to have event. All right. So, Chris, um, what do you know? What you know, you must have had quite a lot. Conversations. What what impression do you did you get about what people were thinking about where WordPress is in twenty twenty three? Well, first I'd say I'm starting to feel like an old man in WordPress a little bit. It's been uh, <laughs> I've been around since two thousand and eight, uh, and I just know a lot of people in WordPress, and I, I just remember starting not knowing anybody, and uh, so it's really good to connect with everybody. The conversations are are really the same as what you see on social media, particularly Twitter. You know, there's debates about. Oh, you must be joking! <laughs> God, I might. There's there's debates about you know Gutenberg and page builders and the future. You know, we've got uh, you know challenges with the economy. I see some agencies downsizing a little bit. Um, you know, tech talent is moving around and stuff like that. So just. Really, just the same stuff you're seeing. We're just talking about in person. AI, of course, is on the table. And, um, you know, for me, the big thing was um, meeting with the, a couple of the LMS players. So, Learn Dash and Sensei and Lifter LMS. Um, we met with Matt in a, um, in a conference room and we we're basically forming a new make team to come up with a common data standard for how some of the fundamentals of LMSs operate, which at first sounds a little counterintuitive of some competitors getting together like that. But there's actually a lot of cool things with it in terms of helping attract more e-learning projects to WordPress on the whole. So it's kind of a grow the pie kind of thing. And here in WordPress, we're often collaborating with our competitors anyways. <laughs> so it's... Uh, you know, that's really cool. And those a lot of those conversations actually started back in Europe. So it's fun to be in US. And here we are pushing it forward, making it official. And then, um, you know, with a goal for WordCamp US next year to have this standard figured out on paper. Um, but that's the high level of what that was. But yeah, great event. I love the size of the venue. It didn't feel claustrophobic. And you could... Sometimes venues are a little tight and it gets so noisy... It's hard to, you got to shout, but because this conference center was so massive, you could really spread out and, uh, you know, see people and have room to get away or find a quiet place to talk and stuff like that. It was, it was a job well done by the organizers and volunteers and all that. All right. So, Kurt, what did you think of it? Well, I thought it was fantastic. I'm still on a high from, from WordCamp US. Um, I'm new to the community side of WordPress, even though I've been working with WordPress since 2004. So 
it's like to your point, San Diego was like the cool kids club. The only problem with San Diego was I wasn't in the cool no, kids club. No, that's not yet. true because I was there. So that can't be so, true. You know, it's only through the generosity of, of Chris and Thomas from Lifter LMS because they drug me around and introduced me to everybody. And then I volunteered in Phoenix and that was a different experience. And then that all came together going to, to, to Maryland for this WordCamp US. It was like a reunion almost. And I knew a lot more people. I met a lot more people. And what, what struck me about this WordCamp was the diversity of the audience. I ran into end users. I ran into freelancers, agencies, founders. And the access that I had to those people was just undaunted. Like I could talk to anybody I wanted and get access to whoever I wanted and meet whoever I wanted, which I thought was was really, really kind of cool. It was an open event that way. All right. So have a... Um, I wasn't being rude, Heather, because obviously you didn't attend like me. So, but I, have you got any thoughts about it? As out viewing slightly outside. Um. So, I mean, in general, I mean, like, no, I wasn't at WordCamp, but I mean, I think that going to conferences and doing the hallway tracks, and I mean, it's a great time to like meet up with with like your friends and and uh, see them in person and have that those those like bonding moments. Uh, in general. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you have the opportunity to go to uh, conferences and, and these types of events, absolutely do it because um, those fights you get into on Twitter, uh, online, in the comment sections on, on blogs, like uh, you can hash it out over a beer uh, when you're, you're at WordCamp. And um, yeah, so uh, I mean, that's, that's all I got to say about these. Uh, that's all I got to say about it. <laughs> Right, yeah. So let's go on to the next one. Um, Apple U-turns. Um, this is about uh, um, California state passing legislation um, that will allow you, you know, to get your Apple product repaired. Um, Apple's notorious about not allowing third parties to repair their products. So, Spencer, um, what did you think of this one? I mean, I think this is just uh, an inevitability, especially when it comes to other products. You know, there's a couple of guys on YouTube that are pursuing this a lot. Um, specifically, he, the, the, he was in the computer repair business. But this applies to things like John Deere tractors. This applies to, for example, subscriptions on your brand new Mercedes where they want to upsell you to be able to go into high gear. Um, somehow, somewhere, everybody got off track between ownership and right to repair and what that all implies. And I think that was because the lobbyists and the marketers could just push the limits of it. But this is the first step in recognizing that people will only be pushed so far. I myself, uh, I have a couple Apple products. I have a new MacBook Air that I didn't think I'd buy, but I have right over to the left my old PowerBook, or I'm sorry, MacBook Pro 2016. I had the battery replaced because it had a defect. It was swelling. They did that one for free after everybody complained. But now it started swelling again. And the thing's only worth 250 bucks, but like I got a thing that's about to blow up. So now I'm faced with this kind of predicament, right? I can still at least get it repaired if I wanted to. But if it was a newer model, I'd be kind of screwed out a $2,000 laptop. And that's the problem, right? Is the people just realize when everything is soldered down or irreplaceable or serialized, that's not the bargain that they, you know, bought into. So, Heather, do you have any idea why Apple have changed? It looks like it's, you know, you're always suspicious, but it, what I've read, it looks like they have to change their position. Were they kind of forced in? They just saw the writing on the wall? Or got any reflection why there's been a bit of a change of heart? Well, I, th I think we have to, like, explain a little bit about what the right to repair movement is in the first place because um, some people may not understand. Like, so one of the reasons why uh, companies like Apple and John Deere um, have been fighting against it um, is, be is like, there's a couple of reasons actually. Um, one, I mean, yes, of course they say like, well, it'll cut into their profits. Like, um, so like, okay, yeah, they can get subscriptions. They can, that you have to pay them to do the repairs. But another, it's, it's because of like the IP protection. So like, um, if you go into some random repair shop, um, that's selling, uh, parts, uh, like, 
you can open up an Apple product and then they're worried that it could be reverse engineered. Um, there's also the quality control issue. So like, say you go and get your screen repaired somewhere else for your iPad or your iPhone, and then um, they don't do it right. And then suddenly uh, your iPhone uh, is no longer waterproof when it's been advertised as waterproof. So now you've got somebody that is suing Apple because it was sold as waterproof, but they got it fixed at a screen repair shop. Um, so there's that. Um, or it could spark um, and kill a baby, but then you're suing Apple because you got it repaired somewhere else. So there's that kind of thing. Um, and then also that goes against like the brand image. Um, so there's, and that can like tank a stock price if somebody's like, my my kid was... Uh, shocked to death by an Apple phone that I so or an iPad that was poorly repaired, but who cares about that? And again, there's the data security, like um, like if somebody's like hacking into like MacBooks, uh, then like you could get into the hard drives that are in there. So that's why they've been fighting against the right to repair the the movement in the bill in California like is very specific. It doesn't allow people to just like break into their Macs and, and start repairing random things. It, what it does allow is for specific kits to be sent out um, that are already quality controlled for people that are trained, uh, that like go through a training program um, so that it, it still can be part of the QA process from Apple. It's um, so that like you are still limiting it. Um, and it also, like, they've never stopped people that, to, from repairing things that are already uh, obsoleted by Apple. And they've never stopped people from repairing uh, John Deere tractors that have already been obsoleted. Um, because they do, like, they allow, they send out manuals on how to do that once the product has been obsoleted. And they allow you to purchase products and they allow you to open, like, to, to manufacture um, things. So, I mean, it's more about, uh, exactly what I've said, like making sure that uh, for the products that are current, um, that you're not damaging the brand and you're not harming the consumers. There was in law school, we studied a lot of, there was a, a rampant 1950 string from 53 to 57 of John Deere tech tra uh, tractors that were repaired <clears throat> by this farmer in Idaho that went off on a baby killing spree. And I think that was the basis of uh, <laughs> Apple's logic. Oh, if, if anybody was allowed to repair suddenly Apple computers in 2023, that they would go off and start murdering babies with them. Well, no, no but I mean, it, it is, I mean, it's not even, it's not. <laughs> that, that, that's it, not I, wrong. I, I, By the way, I'm not making fun of your answer. Yeah. Your answer is 100% right. What's wrong yeah. is how absolutely absurd it is because liability does not start at the point of like, oh, we created the product, but somebody altered it. It's at the last point of context. So to dis allow people to fix things like it's been traditionally on the basis of liability is just a false premise which but the, corporations use. But the problem is like it is correct because perception is like the is everything these days. And yeah, but like, that's not if, enough to take away people's fundamental no, right of something uh, they bought, you know. I, I, I mean, true true, but I mean if it's if it tanks the entire stock price because some random person in Iowa Everything like, will talk. Okay. But listen, you and I agree. I mean, I'm not, yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm no, not I mean, arguing with you, but I'm uh, saying like that's an ad hominem type of an argument. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I, mean, you know, like, I, I 100 percent understand that. We're just we're just trying to explain it to everyone yeah. else. Well, it's, a, well, it's a balance, isn't it? It's, it's a balance, isn't it? You can un, you can understand um, Apple's position to some extent, but on our land, you can understand the other people. It's it, just trying to find a middle right. road, isn't it? But right. that, if you're smart enough to own it and pay for it, you're smart enough to decide who should fix it. And if they offer legitimate parts, which is what this Lewis Rossman in New York was talking about, yeah. Apple doesn't let him have parts anymore. No. He has to go find like old apples and yeah. dissect them to get parts out. Then they started serializing stuff. Yeah. So you couldn't yeah. even take the parts from one thing yeah. to another. That's just purely trying to block yeah, it. Does. You know. I, I listen to him occasionally and it does seem they're pushing the envelope in particular areas, however, 
to the well, but on the other on the other hand, I, I think you're totally correct. Well, if I was Apple, I would have concerns, but I I think the Pacifics that Spence have just outlined what I have listened to and in that. By the way, they did capture that uh, tractor that was murdering all the babies. Yeah, and well, I mean, but also there's a Tesla uh, aftermarket. Yeah. Uh, company that like yeah. finds broken Teslas um, and bids on them to fix other people's Teslas. However, um, well, you don't have it. You've got bigger concerns if you go to San Francisco. You can get <laughs> well, run no, over no, no, it. No, but I mean, this company was shut down by Tesla because like it turned out that a lot of the Teslas that were blowing up were because this shop was using the aftermarket. I mean, like the the Teslas to repair them. And then like it ended up on the news that like the overheating Teslas were actually all coming from this shop. So. Yeah, all right. So, Devin, what do you reckon? Do you think uh, Apple uh, are going in a slightly different direction? Well, um, uh, geez. Um, so does it void your warranty still if you open it up and you... You switch something around. I think so, you'd probably be executed at the Apple store, actually. <laughs> if you did that. So, so that's not part of the bill. Like they don't have to uh, still honor your warranty. If oh you, no! If if you go to a, one of the shops that's been approved, that's been certified, but most of these shops aren't. Got it. I mean, the most I've done is everybody busts their screen. I mean, I would much rather uh, get it repaired than uh, not. And I think it's uh, it's kind of like. You know, what would be the, the scenario if it were a car? Like, I guess Tesla, like you're saying, has some of that lock in, right? Um, but no, I, I don't love, love government intervention much at all, but SB 244, I think it's called. It's hard for me not to back it. And it like mm-hmm. passed 38 in multiple different assemblies, I guess, from what I'm reading the article. And, uh, I like to nitpick government a lot, but it's hard for me to find anything to uh, vote against or see why this wouldn't pass. So I'm for it. Oh, do you? So, Kurt, what do you reckon? With my experience in uh, automotive and power sports and dealing with the the uh, the nationally recognized Magnuson Moss Act for consumer goods, I always get kind of separated by how all these companies or organizations or niches of product think that they're special or they need special treatment, like the Tesla, like computers, like whatever. At the end of the day, to me, it's still a consumer product. And regardless of what state laws or what things get enacted, and remember, I'm not the attorney on the show, that's Spencer. So I might be talking out of my rear end. But, um, you know, class action suit wise, could always drive back to a Magnus and Moss Act and you have the right to repair anything with any... uh, doesn't even have to be OEM parts. They just have to be, uh, you know, at the OEM standard or better and all these kinds of things. Um, I've been on the tail end of a lot of actions working for the OEMs directly in the power sports world where you had to defend the manufacturer, you know, against some kind of aftermarket repair or some kind of whatever based on this Magnuson Moss and buyback law. And, you know, it's a very interesting thing to me. Whenever I see new laws come out, um, I'm always looking for the who's getting Who's getting the favorite thing out of this? Like, who is this really benefiting? You know, at the end of the day, is it going to benefit Apple? Because now they've made these manuals available, but they're $2,000 a piece. You know, in the power sports world, that's what they did. They said, okay, you want to buy a manual? Absolutely. You can buy a PDF for 1500 bucks. You know, by the way, we've got 40 models. You want to be a shop? That's 40 times 1500 That gets you started. So in the end, there's always some way to drag profit or motivation out of whatever these new initiatives are. You just kind of have to dig down and find out where it is. Okay. So, Chris, got any thoughts? I would just say I just bought a new iPhone, and they had the one I turned in was a iPhone 6S, and they said they had not seen one of those in a couple <laughs> of years. So I like to hang on to technology as long as I can, <laughs> as, as long as it's useful. <laughs> but philosophically, I think it's really just... There's also an environmental issue here with the mm. throwaway uh, culture, yeah. but also it's a like the secondary market and the right for somebody like me to hang on and nurse a piece of technology along and save money or whatever. I think is it's important, but more importantly than um, just being a long-term person with certain tech, um, you know, the secondary market. There's people out there who want Apple computers that would gladly pay like a. Uh, a lot less for like a refurbished one. So making that economy more open and accessible to people 
to a secondary Apple market, I think could be a win for everybody. Uh, and that, yeah, I think Apple and the Apple could do better. Just and I think their products would actually get out wider if they do it the right way. Yeah. All right, on to the next story. Oh, yeah, this I uh, really like this one. I uh, um, had a great interview, um, Jamie, with um, um, with Kevin Gurry um, on Jamie's YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. It's very entertaining. Jamie, the Poodle Press, is doing an excellent job. The links will be in the show notes. And he had an excellent conversation about where WordPress is, Gutenberg, I thought it was spot on. So, Devin, what did you think of this? Um, I think actually um, Kevin, I I did invite Kevin on the show and he was going to come on, but um, he's got ill, unfortunately, so he might come Mm. on a later stage, another show. Um, I think he he was spot on, um, but I think he was blowing Jamie's mind away, you know. uh, I think, uh, but I just think he was just totally spot on what he said. What what do you feel, Devin? I I like it. I mean, I think that I've... uh, I've been more and more of a fan of Gutenberg over the years. I think uh, that um, the way that they kind of progressed on that on that show from back in the day when we had visual composer. I mean, I remember looking at visual composer and being like, wow, like this is really very interesting. Um, and it was all short code based and, and to see where we're at now with Gutenberg, like, um, it's coming along. It's still not as pleasing a user experience as some, uh, like I think Kevin's a real bricks guy, right? Like that's what he was wrapping in there. And, um, and I'm a cadence guy, right? Yes. Uh, I'm warming. I, I'm doing a big dive with cadence. At the yeah. But cadence is built atop of Gutenberg largely. I mean, it does support Elementor, but less so uh, than it used to. And uh, and I've also used to be an Elementor guy. So I don't, <clears throat> I'm kind of on the fence and I'm like, kind of like, choose your flavor. Um, if you want to go straight full site editing, that's cool too. I think Spectra is an interesting. Yeah, but what did you? I think the crux. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no worries. Kevin, but um, I think the crux of the thing is that um, Kevin was pointed out. He, feel, he feels the main problem is that they, they, their target audience is everybody, and because that's the target audience, they end up pleasing nobody. Mm. Um, and that's the and I feel also um, there's been a real lack of leadership in in the project to some extent. Um, so okay. I think that's my personal um, beef, but Kevin about trying, you know, trying to have a product that pleases everybody. And that's why you end up not pleasing anybody. What did you think of that observation that he put? Got it. Thanks for clearing up the question there. No, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's, it's difficult from a computer, a community ran standpoint to really progress as fast as a private company, uh, because it is kind of like herding cats and you look at what Wix or Webflow or Squarespace to an extent, maybe not Squarespace so much, um, has done with some of their editing experiences. But no, I wouldn't agree with that. I think, uh, it's progressed very nicely, albeit a little bit slower, but um, WordPress has to cast a wide net, and uh, that's what they're doing. And I, I would agree with the approach that um, it shouldn't target a specific audience more so than another. So, Kurt, what did you think of the of the interview and some of the key points made in it? Uh, it was kind of like uh, I hate to say an echo chamber, right? But as I listened to that interview, I heard a lot of the same things that we discuss ourselves, Jonathan, right? Yeah. What's the, what's the effect of AI on our marketplace? What's the effect? How relevant are we going to be in a five to 10 year span? Um, the page builder conversation to me, Gutenberg versus, you know, the page builders is a super interesting one. Uh, I had a really great conversation with the gentleman from Elementor uh, last week, and he was like, we love Gutenberg because it shows beginners and new people what they can start to do, right? And then everybody everybody always wants more, so then they'll come over to it. That's a backhanded you know? compliment if I've ever yeah. heard one. <laughs> yeah, so um, I will say that I had a lot of customer websites built on Elementor, 
And then I started, as you know, trying to get better and better at the block editor and, and, and using yeah. the cadence tools and the Astra tools and the Spectra tools and just trying to get my head around it. Yeah. Um, especially Lifter's got that new theme called Sky Pilot, and that's full site editing. So now I've got all these different things I'm trying to say that I'm good at, which is really hard to do. And I had a customer go, oh, Kurt, I need some updates. Can I hire you to do these updates? And I said, sure. And I almost forgot for a moment how the sneak and Elementor worked, right? But once I once the screen opened up, I was like, oh, yeah, this goes here, that goes there, this goes this, that. And it was so much easier. And I'm like, it's Elementor to me is still, it's still more intuitive once you know how to use it than the other products, still. All right. So, Spencer, what did you think of this interview? I was going to add, I didn't want to interrupt Kurt. You mean after you pressed the button for Elementor, took a nap? And then woke up and the thing finally loaded on your one gigabyte of RAM that you needed now. So no, I just I just have a more modern host. <laughs> the um, the takeaway, I'm joking. Kurt and I had a long conversation with this. Here's my takeaway is very publicly known now, but I am I am gonna carry the torch for the WordPress community of WordPress as a service because Jamie, who I love to death, is like my British brother from another mother. He is full on full site editing and every one of his videos makes me want to scream out an open window because the problems of WordPress are there's already too many people with too many metaphors and too many parts and too many people trying too many things, constantly breaking things combined with a really energetic young core team trying to forget the last 18 years of history as if it didn't exist. So when you're trying to get stuff done, which is where I deal, I deal with people with money in their wallet who want stuff done. They care nothing about what's going on behind the scenes of the tinkering. And even for a large slice of the tinkerer market, they come to me and say, Spence, end the madness. Please rescue me from this. So this entire line of conversation would be, let's imagine we took a product like Canva, which everybody uses now and loves. This entire ecosystem was possible because nobody was able to go into Canva and start arguing about breaking the underlying code of that SaaS platform. It just brought stability to a market so anybody could play in that ecosystem at any point along the way. You could make stuff for it. You could teach people stuff. You could be a service provider of it. That's the place where I'm going to focus on my WordPress attention. Now, as far as how to fix the problem, unabashed love fest here for Cadence. I have chosen Cadence and certain other product in that stream because unlike what was said about Elementor, I know for a fact that when you have Cadence installed with Cadence blocks, it fixes all of the problems that exist in core right now without the need to resort to full site editing. And it provides the metaphor upon which I can build the kind of following and community training patterns and stuff. So I've picked that team and I'm promoting it because for those who just want to get stuff done, we can just leave the flea market of what's happening in these conversations because it's endless. It's 18 years now, three generations of constantly going in circles and circles and circles and circles and debating this. And I was just getting over the whole, you know, the other debate about the other visual builders and which one was better when we finally, finally arrived, Cadence and Gutenberg is enough along with the other mechanics to just get stuff done. And you know what? I'm putting my name and reputation on the fact that that's the future of WordPress, that the future is not going to be buying lots of parts. It's going to be buying solutions and that everybody's going to shift their attention towards what can I do to make money just with the solutions? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with most of that. That's all um, I got to say about that. Yes. So, um, Chris, um, I thought one thing, I thought Kevin's observation about where WordPress.com and WordPress.org should be, it was like hearing echo because I've been saying that for over five years and I have no idea why that can't be cleared up. I agreed with everything Kevin said about that mess. In my opinion, it's just a total mess. Um, I'm sick of having to try and explain to people what the difference between .com and .org is. And I can't even most of the time coherently explain it. Um, I'm embarrassed with some of my attempts with people. Um, and secondly, um, I, I, do, uh, I do disagree with Devon. I think it is a fundamental problem trying to build something that pleases everybody. 
Um, and I think it's led to a situation which is a bit frustrating. And I think it's very frustrating for the agency professional market, in my opinion. What was your take on this, Chris? I'm on Devin's side because, uh, you know, there's this product philosophy that is just part of WordPress that's not going to change, which is if you take care of the ends, the middle will take care of itself. So the ends being like newbie, first time website builder and being hardcore developer, uh, WordPress has somehow managed to do that. Um, You know, I've seen people use, I've helped people use Cadence who were like newbies and I've also helped more technical people use Cadence or Astra or send them to Elementor, all kinds of stuff. But I think like what De- uh, Devin's saying is Cadence is more on top of blocks and less and less on Elementor. I think that trend is happening. And at the end of the day, what I think Cadence and Astra did particularly well was the starter site. So even <clears throat> um, it definitely helps a new person get launched quickly and overcome some setup hurdles. It also helps like an agency person you know, do something a little more custom with something like Cadence Cloud or whatever and and get something more advanced up quickly. But I think the reality is it's all about AI. So when you have the conversational interfaces of like, who cares what the underlying technology is? Whoever figures out how to get people building websites with a conversational interface that works well and just makes that next mic drop moment for the website building industry... Whoever wins there is going to really push the market forward. If Elementor does it, they're going to, you know, kind of claw back some market share. If it's more like the web host using WordPress and native Gutenberg or whatever, you know, it's going to, it's going to accelerate the, the native WordPress adoption. So I think that's something to keep an eye on in terms of where we're going. And in terms of WordPress.com versus .org, I don't think it's a hill to die on. It is a little bit unfair to the rest of the, you know, to the other WordPress um, evangelists and whatnot that they, that's like kind of like an unfair advantage to have that WordPress.com. But I don't see them changing the name. I don't. Oh, think no, I didn't mean it. I have to, I'm sorry to interrupt a little bit. I didn't mean yeah. it in that way. I, I think I totally agree with Kevin. I think, I think if it was. Set up in the right way, it could be very beneficial for both sides. It's just I don't even understand the logic of the way it's been set up, Chris, because it could be it could be highly beneficial. That that that's why I'm so puzzled by it all. Chris. I think one of the kind of counterintuitive things there is that if the if it were to happen to the WordPress project where Automatic wasn't the main contributor, um things could accelerate and get a little more interesting, you know, cause like that it's, it's not that it's not interesting, but there is like an asymmetry in contribution. Um, so if, if more smaller companies and hosting companies and stuff were able to do more, which is actually really hard if you're not a hosting company to do significant contribution, um, since that's where a lot of the money is uh, in the WordPress economy. But that could help spread the, you know, the influence around a little more. I want to say, Chris brought up one really, really important point that I want to just add two cents to. <laughs> that I remember from the early, early, early days when we were just, you know, basically using HTML and text editors, and then something like Macromedia Dreamweaver came along, right? Or and then Flash. Everybody jumped to the tool because it made the production easier. It made the ability to visualize easier. But at the end of the day, the website was still HTML and CSS. The AI tools that are here today are, I use the term toys, like Adam and Sujay's thing. It's a toy because it's just essentially creating a pretty flat picture. It doesn't have the mechanics working on the back end, but it's just going to be this much time until the mechanics can be created as well when you'll be able to prompt the AI to actually generate the full mechanical and visual thing you want. But here's the reason why it's so important for this conversation, in my opinion, to stop about all the toys and the tools today. Because the relationships that people have with the human customers are the only thing that will matter when the AI stuff comes in. Because the human beings are going to need and want the other humans to guide them through that new thing. They're not just going to go blindly talk into the computers and hope for the best because they don't even understand the basic concepts or the metaphors of things that will be created. And that's why I emphasize in a time of transition, 
this, you have to go back to your tribal instincts and have to earn the customer's hearts and minds, and they'll follow you anywhere. So debating over this toy and that toy in Gutenberg or full site editing is a waste of energy right now because we can see the AI is this close to coming along. So it's more important to get the, the customers understanding your brand and that you're the person or the company that can guide them. And for freelancers, even more. All this change brings huge opportunity to profit from just being one step ahead of your next door neighbor. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, Heather, I think one of the other fundamental problems is a higher management that's totally out of touch. That is has a duality. Um, it's been evident to me for a while. We've got a top management that's lost interest, but power is in is indictive. Um, so it's hard to give up. So you've got, you've got a duality of a kind of indifference, but also power is intoxicating, isn't it? Um, so I think there's a clear problem with the management in a way. What do you reckon? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, it definitely, uh, I, yeah. I think I've said all I need to say in the past about like how I mean WordPress is meant for they sell it for the the they sell it as an easy upgrade from like Squarespace or Wix like once you once you get locked in and you, and you realize oh I can't do as much as I I want to do on this then I need to go to Squarespace but then like for the average person um, that's not a developer. Um, it is too hard to use, and then they either go back to Squarespace or they hire somebody like. Well, can, this, I, just, can I just like, can I just slightly yeah. interrupt there? That's yeah. the whole thing. They 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 should be able to go to WordPress dot com, not Squarespace, and then um, if they need to go to WordPress org, they've got a much easier route, haven't they? Right, right? No, no. I mean, but that's that's the thing. I mean, like it is too complicated. Like the like Gutenberg is too complicated for people to use, um, like coming from something like, uh, coming from Squarespace, but like, it, it, it's like the people that know that they, or the people that, uh, are designing their own work, websites, but know they need more. Um, and then they find WordPress, like it's too much. And then they go to th something like Elementor, uh, then they'll stay with Elementor because like it reminds them of the things that they know how to do. Um, but if you, and so those people are never going to hire somebody like us because they're like, okay, I want to do it myself. Otherwise they're just going to go to somebody like us in the first place and just, they don't care what we use. They just want their site done. So, I mean, I think, I kind of think that the, this is just a pedantic argument that we're just going to keep having over and over again. Because it's it's just for the developers to argue with each other about which one we think is better when the people that want the sites are, they don't care. Right, you all. Yep, right. So we're going to go for a mid-break, folks. It's been a great discussion. We will be back in a few moments, folks. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. Coming back, folks, just want to point out, if you're a WordPress freelancer professional and you're looking for a great hosting partner, why don't you look at WP Tonic? Um, we provide great packages for our partners, plus a load of options. We will help you maintain the website. We provide um, email functionality as part of the hosting package for your marketing needs your clients marketing needs we are we really are uh, a different level of hosting partner for your projects if that's interesting go over to wp tonic slash partners wp hyphen tonic.com slash partners and we can have a chat if you're interested please become part of the tribe so on we go um oh my god <laughs> favorite of all. 
<laughs> oh dear, it's like these are good stories, aren't they? We work um, such substantial doubts that it can stay in business. Shock horror. Um, so I'm going to go back to Ever again. This is like our old favourite, this is, isn't it? You know, Adam Newman, um, Drifters, him and his wife, Drifters Supremos, if I've ever seen them. Were you shocked at this? Because I wasn't. <laughs> no, I mean, so, okay. Uh, well, Adam Newman has been with the company for a while. Um, and he's, he's the ghost of his presence is still there, I think. Ever. Yeah. Well, okay. So um, the gist of this article is that um, we work big surprise um, after COVID. Um, people aren't returning to go to offices because they've realized, well, I mean, the, the, the companies that would go to WeWork are, are um, small businesses or startups uh, that wanted a place to co-work together. Um, but now those those companies are just kind of working remotely or working from home or they don't exist anymore because they didn't survive COVID or they don't have funding. So um, uh, even though retail space is even cheaper than it ever was, because we work with started um, when retail space was super cheap back in uh, like right after 2008, like the housing crash, um, they uh, like they just can't get butts in seats now. Um, so like their last CEO has, has left. They now have a new interim CEO. They went public finally in, uh, 2021, but, um, it wasn't a huge offering. So, um, like now what they really need to do, I mean, and I've been to WeWorks and they're great. Um, like, I mean, it's, it's really good to have that, uh, that like office space when I need it, when I'm in a random town. But I mean, I've also used like my Regis subscription to be able to do that, to like have an office when I need a call to go to. So, um, or I can just use like any hotel lobby. <laughs> you know, like it's, there's always a place to go. So, um, so I mean like what they, they really, really need to do. Um, they, they need to come up with like some kind of new market segment uh, that aren't those like small businesses or or people that want to co work now because they're not returning to the office. They they aren't going to. I don't see that yeah, happening well, anytime soon. Yeah, what is office? I've forgotten. I don't yeah, know. So, um, yeah. So, see, um, so Devin, what do you think of re? <laughs> I was, I was, I'm just surprised it, it kind of staggered on. Really, to be quite truthful. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when we were looking at, uh, we had an office in downtown San Diego, right? We had like six or seven employees here, and then we had one in Rochester. But before we leased our office, we took a tour of several co-working spaces. And I I have a small office here, but like they would jam in six people in a space about this size and charge like $3,500, $3,600 a month. And we got like a triple the size space in like a creative office. So the model didn't work. Like the kombucha was interesting and the beer was interesting. Mm -hmm. But like they sold you on this whole network effect too. Like your startup will like excel with the help of these other startups. And there's all mentor community here. I'm like, well, how many are doing WordPress and blank stairs? I'm frankly surprised it's held on this long. I'm surprised it's been pumped up with billions of dollars and continuing to lose. It's going to be a huge hit for commercial real estate. San Francisco is already suffering. LA is having a lot of issues, not so much down here in San Diego as much, but uh, New York. And this is just another big hit. And um, it's sad to see it go, but... Adam Newman. I mean, do you guys ever watch that show about him where he's just... Well, I interviewed... His, uh, I, I've in, I forgot the gentleman's name, but I interviewed the CEO of meetup.com and he was one of these chief staff and work knows Adam very well. Yeah. And he wasn't oh. very... Co- he said he was just, bon- he was just bonkers, the whole thing. And Adam is totally bonkers. And his wife's even more bonkers than him. So uh, um, there we go. The whole thing. But he must have something. He, just, he has just swanned off. He's just got people to give him another load of money. He's on to um, yeah, I don't some think other project, isn't he? You know, he's doing fine, isn't he? 
Yeah, he's not suffering, but you know, it's sad. Don't get me started on meetups also. I, I would love to start a meetup and we had it going out of WeWork for a while, but then they commercialized it and want us to start com- converting our meetup attendees into co-working uh, customers, which we didn't want any part of that. So we left that. But anyways, um, my bottom line is, uh, see you later. Somebody else will come pick up the ashes and do it right. That's just the way it works. So Spencer, what, um, wasn't very surprised. I'm just surprised it staggered on, but, um, I, what, what, it, I had to Newman, you know, I'm not, I'm not being very generous, have I, but he must have something. He's got some magic powers, isn't he? Because Bengali. Is it just that, is it? Well, first of all, we talk about Elizabeth uh, Holmes and how she got the riot act and the book thrown at her for, I would say, maybe slightly more fiduciary irresponsibility. But Adam Newman got away with this because he basically took 10 of the 15 billion that they lost from a Japanese, you know, very honor driven person who didn't go after him for a dime of the 10 billion. Now, famously before Adam Newman and his Svengali wife, Rebecca, did this, there was the guy who started that plugin called Color, where it lasted about five minutes. I think they took a half a billion dollars, never even produced an app. That guy just like came right across the screen like, like a moth, you know, to a flame. <laughs> half a billion, you know. I find it unbelievable after the 2008 crash and the recent crash and the mortgage, I find it unbelievable that people don't just look at the fact that there's a company there that owns commercial real estate where cities like Chicago couldn't give away high rises right now. And they're just like going, oh, we're going to get some more money. We've flushed $15 billion down the toilet. Nobody is ever going back to the office anytime soon. We're going to start looking for more money. And nobody's saying anything about the fact that that's just like, blatant fiduciary irresponsibility, if not outright fraud. The guy himself got out in time and now he's off to another thing that's real estate related that has to do with like tenants taking yeah. ownership of their own space and all the yeah. rest. And it's just rehashing yeah. the same thing. So in the in the 80s when I grew up and I was a teenager, there was all these guys on uh, local TV that would have in the early days, like Billy Mays days, could have like the fake jets and the fake cars. And there was a couple of well-known who'd be like, you know, look at my lifestyle, real estate lifestyle. And they later got pursued, just like some of the religious phonetic guys, for defrauding people. These guys need to be taken to task because this is just outright fiduciary fraud. And the rest of it is up to people. The problems of society are not going away. It's not their cause or their fault. But Honestly, to be saying that anybody's going to be returning to the high rises of San Francisco or Chicago or LA or New York anytime soon, no way. Maybe if they figured out how to turn it into residential and they priced it appropriately, but I read a very interesting article about that. These high rises are built with these tensioned floors and it's really difficult to drill through them and make the plumbing and the other... You well, know, I think... It, um, I'm sorry, because obviously, because of your past, you know a lot more about this than me, but it just occurred to me that it could be... But it would, it would need a lot of subsidy from from government and to so it, you could do that kind of convert if it was possible in any shape or form because they, it would be so expensive that... You, the rents would be unaffordable for a lot of people. The, the, problem, the problem is more density and zoning. It's We can't cover that here, but like the problem in areas like California particularly is there's a NIMBY mentality yeah. to the zoning. The 80-year-old baby boomers who own three acres don't want anybody to have like two townhouses on a 50-acre lot. And the problem with that is that like there's just not enough land to go around in some areas. In the city of Chicago, it's more mechanical. Like there's all these high rises downtown that nobody's using for offices, but they were built with stressed, you know, floors and they didn't have windows for everybody, don't have plumbing. And the other part of it is the cost of ownership right now is so high, they wouldn't be able to make them affordable for normal people to go into anyway. So we've got a lot of issues to deal with, but I'd say at the heart of it, number one heart of it actually is the cause of this company or from it. It's that we allowed corporations and non-human individuals to buy residential property. That's the heart of this problem. Yeah. Like in areas like Dallas, there's 4,200 corporate owned houses and 128 individual owned houses. And when that Jenga game comes flying down, 
it's not going to be good for the market. Ne- neither will it be in other areas because the cost of an average home went from, a, I think, 205000 in 2019 to 463000 And the interest rates went from 4% to 7.8%. So somebody has to make $130,000 with no debt to basically afford a shoebox today. And not very many people can do that. So right. that's the problem. Yeah. All right. This movie, all right, Kurt and Chris, hopefully you don't mind because uh, uh, I'm going to drop one of the, I'm going to drop the last story because I can't have this going too long. But I, I wanted to discuss this next story. Um, WordPress.com launches a hundred year domain and hosting plan for, was it $38,000? Um, when I, when I read this, I thought, is it April the 1st? Has the summer disappeared that quick? You know, um, so Devon, you chimed in so you can start. This, uh, this I, really, I, I this thought is, it was a joke. And then I clicked on the link and it's not a joke. And there's actually me- mechanics or like systems in place to pass it off to your heirs and things like this. And then he went on, you know, Mullenweg talked about getting rid of lifetime licenses. Like, the thing I'm general manager of Cadence, you know Ben Rittner and Kathy do so oh, much. Ben, work. Ben's a fantastic. Yeah, guy, you know. but what kills me is the lifetime licenses for that. And uh, well, I bought one. That's why I, I bought well, it. I'm That's sure why I'm supporting. The- That's why I'm supporting it because yeah. I believe unlimited you know, sites for your life. Uh, it's just not a way to build a business, in my opinion. But you know, Astra's doing it. It's just the competitive market. Well, I, I like ben, that I like, that's why I like Ben more than you, David. <laughs> I, will, I will come clean your house every day for the rest of my life for free. <laughs> um, but, but his way of you know talking about how plugins should get away from it, and then a hundred years, like I'd be cool if this was like five years, maybe ten year plan, but. This is effectively a lifetime license right here. So I, it contradicted what he said about how plugins need to go away from lifetime. Can I license. just? I, I, I want to. I just want to put this to you, Devin. But you probably you probably will not want to answer it, and I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with it. Isn't this? You know, this was linked to his interview um, last year in in South and. Um, in not the North Pole, the South Pole, when he was being interviewed with the penguins. Uh, um, um, this is an individual that lives in a different world of the super rich. I, I, I just think he's totally divorced from reality, to be quite truthful, which is really nice. You know, good luck to him. You know, he, you know, hard worker, built something fantastic, and he's got a ton of money, but it, it just... Just bonkers stuff, far as I'm concerned. Well, what's your comment about that? <laughs> uh, I'll just say it's a head scratcher. It left me scratching my head, and I think it most people too. So I'll leave it at that. So, Chris, bonker time, I reckon. Bonker, bonker. I think it's just an extreme case of a classic pricing tactic. It's two tactics, actually, which are... One of them is price anchoring. So you show a really big price and then your other stuff actually looks cheaper. So that's just like part of pricing psychology. And then the other thing, some people call that a decoy product. Like if you don't actually sell it, um, I don't recommend decoy products. I do recommend having a high priced offer. Uh, just because, and that's the other part too, is there is always a portion of your market that's like, will pay any price that's, you know, super committed, super high. Um, so to me, it just looks like those two factors, price anchoring and then that small sliver of like the 1% or smaller in your in your market that can't afford that and will pay it. I mean, I get it. Like I just bought some key domain names for like 10 years. because I'm like, I just don't want that to accidentally expire, go away. I mean, I can see the psychology behind it. And for a big corporation... You know who? Uh, you know the call say call sales for the enterprise. Uh, I see where you're coming from. I think we'd be like, I know I'm going to be lucky if I'm here in two years' time. But I, I think most people, the AI is coming for them anyway. So uh, I mean, you're um, talking about you can be around Japanese. for bloody hundred years. Good luck to you. That's what I've got to say. I mean, some business people think in decades and even centuries. Like it's a thing. It's just, it's, it's maybe very small, but it's a thing. I'm gonna. Let it, I, I was gonna let Kurt, but Spencer just you know. I'm just gonna say I'm yeah. sad because 
1977, when I was 11, I signed up for the Ronco Lifetime 8-Track Cassette and LP Club. And I've been getting those every year, except the problem is I can't play them anymore, along with my floppy drive kit and everything else. So the, the sheer ridiculousness that somebody is saying, I'm going to pay 38 grand, which by the way is more than retail price by about 200% if they just bought it at annual pricing. It's just provocative. That's all this is. This is just Matt walking around with his backpack, trying to poke around and see if anybody will listen to what he's talking about because it's just ridiculous. There's no logic to this in any way, shape, or form. We are not going to be using screens in 100 years. We are just not going to even be in the same space. At the rate technology is changing, we may not all be on this planet, or our ancestors may not be. But to, I'm going to give you 38 grand today instead of investing that in something more tangible. Well, I think Newman would, because he's got, Adam Newman would give you 30, because he's got plenty of other people's money, so he'd cough up 38 back grand. I think, I think only, he might have been talking only, to Adam and Rebecca Newman about this plan. Yeah, exactly. I think he's been talking to Adam too much, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, um, so, Kirk, what do you reckon? I think it's great marketing. That's what I think. I, You know, uh, to Chris's point, you know, there is a market for everybody for everything. And when you take something and you throw it out there in the stratosphere with this giant price and, you know, seemingly exclusive access, somebody's going to buy in and they're going to go, we just locked this down for 100 years. We're here to stay. And I know people that have paid $200,000 for a Ducati. I know people that have paid $3 million for a car. Um, and you say to yourself, well, that's ridiculous. Well, this seems ridiculous. But there's a market for it somewhere. Yeah. So power, power to him, man. Kudos to him. And he said it with a smile and confidence from stage. Even that was awesome. So okay. have a, let me, let me, the difficulty is when so, the person who's supposed to be solving real problems is out talking about that stuff instead of like yeah. the real problems that are unsolved. Yeah, that, that is that, that. That's the thing that concerns me, Spencer. So have a bonker, bonker, or. Fantastic marketing, or is it a bit of both? Bonka bonka and fantastic marketing. So back in the 80s, and then again for a little bit in the 90s, uh, an airline offered unlimited uh, oh, yeah. flights for the rest of your life yeah, for the right. low, low oh, price. Uh, first it was $100,000, and then later they, they offered it for $400,000. And there were, I think, they sold 10 of them total. One of the people that bought them was Mark Cuban. Um, and yeah, right. then and uh, like a couple of other people, um, bought them. And, uh, I mean, at the time, uh, it was, I mean, I, th I think the second time they sold them, it was for a million dollars, um, a person. And I mean, lifetime unlimited flights, uh, because the airline needed money up front. Um, and I mean, it was for the person's lifetime. You couldn't turn it on, uh, like hand it on. But I mean, very quickly, you could become a million miler and then a 10 million miler and a whatever. And with that, you get extra perks from the airline, of course. Um, basically, like enough free flight miles that like that you can start getting free flights for everyone else. And I'm looking at it like this. So yeah, they're going to, they, they will sell at least one of these. And, um, Imagine like a million dollars back then, uh, they've gotten way more than a million dollars value out of that. And they will continue to get way more than a million dollars value out of this for the rest of their lives. So you, you look at $38,000 now, how much in just 50 years is it going to cost for hosting? How much is it going to cost in... In 10 years for hosting. I mean, we wouldn't have even thought that like milk was going to be $10 a gallon. Uh, you, la you would laugh at like the, the at $5 a gallon for gasoline um, when we were kids. Uh, I remember when it was 80 cents when I first started driving. And that wasn't that long ago. So um, yeah, I mean, we're laughing now. But yeah, no, I think that people will buy this because they they understand economics. Well, oh, thanks for that. I, I was really inside. Thanks, Ever. I never thought that. That's fantastic. So, I'm going to. So, Devin, what's the and we're going to wrap it up now. Devin, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to, Devin? Sure. Yeah, check my website out, devin.org, or on uh, X, formerly Twitter, uh, at Interwebs. And Kurt, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to? 
Well, uh, I'm the only Kurt Von Arman on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn almost every day. So that's a great place to connect and start a conversation. And then anything money on the Nomas online is, is me. And Chris, what's the best way to find out more about you? You can find me at lifterlms.com. I'm also active on Twitter or X, just Chris Badgett. Look for my name. And Heather, what's the best way to find out more about your thoughts and what you're up to? Uh, I am Heather Riel on everywhere that you can find me. And um, yeah, yeah, HeatherRiel.com. That's fine. Been a great show. Thanks for listening, folks. Um, we'll be back next month with. Uh, some great WordPress stories and tech stories in general and some hopefully interesting insights. I think the panel's been excellent this month. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. We really do appreciate it. Why not visit the Mastermind Facebook group? And also to keep up with the latest news, click wp-tonic.com forward slash newsletter. We'll see you next time.